who don't know me, my name is Dr. David Loy. I'm the chairman of the Convocation Committee here at Concordia University. Uh, the task of the Convocation Committee is to bring speakers who address enduring questions and ideas, but address them from a perspective you might not get from our own faculty here at Concordia. I'd like to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Daniel Zager. Zager, I always get that wrong. Dr. Daniel Zager, as you can see from the brochure, is Associate Dean and head of the Sibley Music Library at Eastman School of Music. Uh, aside from what's written in here, he has served in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod in the formation of that Burgundy hymnal right in front of you, helped to go through all of the submissions of hymns and figure out which ones a congregation could actually sing and would want to sing, and which of the many, many submissions maybe were a really good try, but shouldn't be in the hymnal. Uh, he served the church in a variety of other ways. He's taught at Concordia University River Forest, and before that at Oberlin College, and then of course at Eastman where he is now. Uh, he's the author of a book, the title is in your brochure, The Gospel Preached Through Music, The Purpose and Practice of Lutheran Ch Church Music, which was good enough to get not just published, but an award. Uh, will you please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Zager to Concordia? Well, thank you all very much. It's wonderful to be here. I've never been to Concordia, Irvine until yesterday, and it's just been a real treat. I thank you for your hospitality and for coming out for this convocation. You should have a handout from me as well. The logic of page one is that I want you to be able to follow names, terms, that sort of thing as I speak. So uh, simply follow along on page one and I won't be giving dates of people and that sort of thing because it's written out for you. And some terms you may not know are there as well. So I'm hoping that will just help you to follow along. And then I'll direct you to the other three pages of the handout uh, as needed as we go through the, uh, through the lecture. My primary area of interest as a music historian is the 16th century, particularly the musical ramifications of the various Reformation movements in Europe. 2017, of course, marks a significant 500th Reformation anniversary, namely Martin Luther's October 31st, 1517, posting of his 95 theses concerning the power and efficacy of indulgences. To be sure, the Reformation, or the Protestant Reformation, was not a single historical event. In fact, there were various movements in 16th century Europe that focused on reforming the church. In addition to Luther in Wittenberg, there was Huldrych Zwingli in Zurich and John Calvin in Geneva. There was an English Reformation triggered by Henry VIII seeking, but not receiving, a papal annulment to his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. As the English monarch subsequently took steps to separate his kingdom from the papacy, there was in due course consideration of theological matters, primarily by Thomas Cranmer. Then the so-called Counter-Reformation, or Catholic Reformation, found its focus in the Council of Trent, which met in several phases from 1545 to 1563 to examine the need for reforms within the Church of Rome. Of these various Reformation movements, it was the Lutheran stream that was particularly receptive to and encouraging of music within the liturgy. The purpose of my talk here today is to examine the formative years, just four years, of 1523 to 1526, when Luther and his co-workers laid a foundation for Lutheran church music, a foundation that continues to inform the nature, purpose, and use of church music in our own time. As we shall see, Luther prized continuity with the long tradition of liturgy and its attendant music in the Western church. I say long tradition, because the roots of our liturgy may be traced back not merely to 16th century Wittenberg, but in broadest outlines to the second century Mediterranean world, as articulated in Justin Martyr's oft quoted description of Christian liturgy in Rome around 150 AD. Luther was interested in retaining the church's long and rich inheritance of liturgy and music, preferring continuity rather than disruption or novelty. Part one of my talk will examine Luther's liturgical and musical presuppositions as articulated in his 1523 formula Missae concerning the mass in the Latin language and in his 1526 Deutsche Messe 
concerning the Mass in the German language, the vernacular of Luther's time and place. These two writings by Luther are profitably considered in tandem, one in light of the other. Part two of my paper concerns Luther's call for vernacular hymns, or chorales, a new genre, but one built on earlier traditions of vernacular sacred song. Finally, part three will examine briefly Luther's musical foundation as it has continued and been perpetuated from the 16th century through the 20th century and into our own time. So part one, before turning to Luther's 1523 formula Missae, it is worth recalling very briefly the major events in Luther's lifetime after the 1517 posting of the theses. As professor of theology at the University of Wittenberg, Luther was a prolific writer, the printing press spreading his theological thought quickly throughout Europe. Based largely on his writings, a papal bull of 1520 threatened Luther with excommunication, which actually came in January of 1521. At the Diet of Worms in 1521, Luther was asked to repudiate his writings, but he refused to do so. The subsequent edict of Worms especially officially made Luther a heretic and an outlaw. So on his return trip from Worms, Luther was diverted by plan of Elector Frederick the Wise to the Wartburg Castle near Eisenach, where he could lay low for a time after those tumultuous events at Worms. There he continued his study and writing, notably producing a German translation of the New Testament, which was published in 1522. While Luther was at the Wartburg, Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt and others were initiating a series of problematic reforms back in Wittenberg, including the abolition of sacred objects, such as paintings and statues in churches and monastic establishments. With Karlstadt taking the lead in defining reform, Luther had little choice but to return to Wittenberg where he preached a series of sermons in March 1522 that constituted a first step in settling the disturbances and establishing his agenda for theological reform. Luther carefully distinguishing between charge changes or clarifications that were required immediately as opposed to those that might be desirable but whose implementation could be delayed for a time. An urgent consideration for Luther was the Mass and how it should be conducted. It is his 1523 formula Missae, an order of Mass and Communion for the Church at Wittenberg, where we find some of Luther's earliest views on music for the divine service. And here I just want to quickly encourage all of you who are students of church music and theology to consider at some point buying volume 53 of the American edition of Luther's works. It's his volume on liturgy and hymns. And I have to tell you, every time I go into that volume, I discover something new. It's very rich, and it will inform your thinking about all matters of church music. Earlier in 1523, at least by May, Luther had published general principles for a reform of the liturgy, that pamphlet entitled, Concerning the Order of the Gottesdienst. There, Luther comments on the daily prayer offices, Sunday Mass and Vespers, daily masses, and festivals of the saints. His primary emphasis throughout this document is the necessity for preaching God's word. He also commends the use of the Psalms with, quote, some good responsories and antiphons. Significantly, with regard to music, he wrote, and I quote, let the chants in the Sunday masses and vespers be retained. They are quite good and are taken from scripture. That single sentence carried enormous significance with regard to retaining the vast musical repertories of Western chant for continuing use in the churches of the Lutheran Reformation. By December of 1523, Luther then published the more detailed Formula Missae, in which he moved step by step through the Mass, focusing on the theological meaning of the Mass, and along the way, laying a foundation for Lutheran musical practice. At the outset, Luther notes that he has made no innovations, and he decries those who, quote, delight only in novelty and tire of it as quickly when it is worn off. He states his overall principle plainly, and I quote, we therefore first assert it is not now nor ever has been our intention to abolish the liturgical service of God completely, but rather to purify the one that is now in use from the wretched accretions which corrupt it, 
and to point out an evangelical use, end quote. What was it that had corrupted the mass? Luther states it succinctly, quote, the mass became a sacrifice. He refers specifically to the offertory and to the canon of the mass, both of which comprehend the mass as a human sacrificial offering to God, a good work, rather than a sacrament, testament, promise, or blessing extended by a loving God to his people, the Lord's Supper. Luther refers to the offertory as, quote, that utter abomination, to the canon of the mass as, quote, that abominable concoction drawn from everyone's sewer and cesspool. Luther was very plain spoken. Luther thus concludes, quote, let us therefore repudiate everything that smacks of sacrifice together with the entire canon and retain only that which is pure and holy and so order our mass, end quote. In fact, Luther retained almost everything else in the mass as it had come down through the centuries, eliminating only the sequence, the proper mass chant that followed the Alleluia. The sequence was a significant creative vehicle for medieval poets and composers, but Luther specified only three that were worth retaining. That's three out of thousands. Similarly, the Council of Trent, some 40 years later, would eliminate all but four sequences in its reform of the mass for the Roman Catholic Church. Given that Luther eliminated very little of the mass, the implications for music, both for chant and polyphony, are significant. During Luther's time, and indeed going back as far as the 12th century, music for the mass included both chant, a single line of music sung in unison, and polyphony, two or more vocal lines or parts that combine and interact well with each other. By Luther's time in the early 16th century, it was often the case that the ordinary of the mass was sung polyphonically. The so-called ordinary texts are always present and always the same, regardless of liturgical occasion. Those texts are the Kyrie, Gloria in Excelsis, Creed, Sanctus, and Agnus Dei. And it was often the case that the proper of the mass, those texts that were individually and specifically appointed for each Sunday or feast day in the church's calendar, were often, though not always, sung monophonically in the great tradition of Western chant. Luther makes clear in the formula Missae that he retains the entire ordinary of the mass, thus at a single stroke, retaining enormous musical repertories of both chant and polyphony. Similarly, with the proper of the mass, Luther enumerates his retention of the introit, gradual, alleluia, and communion chants omitting, for theological reasons, only the sequence and the offertory. Thus, Luther retains vast repertories of Latin chant in his revised order of the mass. Alone among the continental reformers, Luther, who stated that he had always loved music, opted for continuity rather than disruption or novelty. In that way, he differed very much from his contemporaries, Zwingli and Calvin. Zwingli omitted music altogether from his services, and Calvin permitted only unaccompanied unison singing of metrical psalm paraphrases. We must not take for granted Luther's generous view of music. The Formula Missae is a foundational document of the Lutheran Reformation that not only purified and clarified the theology of the Mass, understanding it as the Gottesdienst, the divine service, but also preserved enormous portions of the church's vast musical heritage, both chant and polyphony. How did Luther come to know Latin polyphonic music for the church? Prior to the events of 1517 to 1523, Elector Frederick the Wise of Saxony had founded not only his new university in Wittenberg in 1502, but also his new castle church in Wittenberg, which was dedicated the following year in January 1503. In these pre-Reformation years, the castle church had its own group of clergy and musicians responsible for daily mass and office liturgies. Frederick the Wise also provided the requisite funding that enabled manuscript collections of polyphonic music to be copied for use at Wittenberg's castle church, as well as for use at the elector's chapel in the neighboring city of Torgau, his principal residence. A total of 19 manuscript sources of Latin polyphony used at the castle church in Wittenberg have come down to us. 
Five of the manuscripts include works securely attributed to that greatest of Renaissance composers, Josquin de Pre. Luther spoke highly of Josquin's music on several occasions, notably commenting in 1531 that, and I quote, God has preached the gospel through music too, as may be seen in Josquin. Luther knew Josquin's Latin sacred music, for example, his settings with the mass ordinary, through hearing that music sung in Wittenberg at the castle church. Thus, in 1523, when thinking about how the mass should be observed in Wittenberg, Luther retained not only the text of the ordinary of the mass, but by implication, the magnificent musical repertories that had already been crafted by the finest composers of the church, who had often set the mass ordinary, a practice that would continue during the 16th century. Earlier, I commented that the 1523 formula missae concerning the Latin mass is profitably read in tandem with the 1526 Deutsche Messe, Luther's German language order of service. In the Deutsche Messe, Luther refers at the outset to the lasting value of the Latin Mass. Remember, he's, he's crafting a German order of service, but he starts out by talking about the Latin order of service. Here's what he has to say. It is not now my intention to abrogate or to change this Latin service. We shall continue to use it when or where we are pleased and prompted to do so. For in no wise would I want to discontinue the service in the Latin language because the young are my chief concern. And if I could bring it to pass, and Greek and Hebrew were as familiar to us as the Latin, and had as many fine melodies and songs, we would hold mass, sing, and read on successive Sundays in all four languages, German, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. I do not at all agree with those who cling to one language and despise all others." End quote. Thus, Luther finds value in retaining the Latin mass, with the sermon preached and prayer spoken in German, even as he willingly outlines and provides a fully German order of service. I call this, with apologies to AT&T, Luther's power of and. He wanted both Latin and German language liturgies, just as musically he retained both chant and polyphony. What was the impetus in 1526 for laying out a German language mass in order of service? In part, it was due to the appearance of various German language masses that had begun to be published during 1522-1523 in various cities. Luther was urged to weigh in on the issue, but he didn't do so immediately because he had two reservations. First, he objected to those who wanted to eliminate the Latin mass completely. Second, as a sensitive musician, he was unwilling to join German words to existing Latin chants. Instead, he worked deliberately to fashion music that would accommodate the rhythms of the German language. But there was also a second impetus for his German mass in order of service. Luther stated that it was developed, quote, for the sake of the unlearned lay folk. The cultural problem faced by Luther was the reality of a society that was only partially literate. Thus, his German mass was developed as, one, uh, developed as one means of teaching the unlearned. And as we might expect from Luther, music played an important role. He specified, for example, that, quote, after the gospel, the whole congregation sings the creed in German, namely the choral, wir glauben all an einen Gott, the three stanzas of we all believe in one true God. Luther expected the unlearned lay folk to learn the creed. Strophic music could enhance that task of memorization. A second example of how he used music in the Deutsche Messe. In a quite subtle way, Luther fashioned music to be an almost subconscious teaching tool. He did so by basing the chant formula for the words of institution on the chant formula for the gospel lesson heard earlier in the Mass thus coaxing the ear to comprehend the words of institution for the Lord's Supper as the pure gospel gift that it is. I want to demonstrate this for you. Um, and I'm going to sing three brief excerpts. In the Deutsche Messe, Luther caused to be printed out an entire gospel lesson with all the pitches. So the, the, the text is underlaid to, to the music. 
and he chose the gospel lesson for the fourth Sunday in Advent, uh, John chapter 1, verses 19 through 28. And this whole thing is, you can see it in a facsimile edition of the Deutsche Messe. But I'm just going to chant the first verse for you. Here's what it says. It'll, at first you're going to hear, thus writes uh, St. John in his gospel. And then verse uh, 19. And this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? So I'm just going to chant that verse. Then without interruption, I'll go into the words of institution. Uh, chanting is my second example. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, then a pause, and then my third example, which is, in the same way also after supper, he took the cup and said. So I want to chant all three of these in a row without any interruption. You're not going to be listening to a melody, but you will be hearing a melodic profile. This is a chant formula. And what I want you to fix on is the opening pitches of the gospel lesson, and then how you will hear those same opening pitches, that same chant contour, in the two parts that I will chant of the words of institution. So here goes. So schreibt der heilige Johannes in sein Evangelion. Dies ist das Zeugnis Johannes, da die Juden sandten von Jerusalem, Priester und Leviten, da sie ihn fragten, wer bist du? Unser Herr Jesu Christ, in der Nacht, da er verraten ward, nahm er das Brot, dankt und brachs und gab seinen Jüngern und sprach. Desselben gleichen auch den Kelk nach dem Abendmahl und sprach. So what I'm trying to demonstrate to you is that Luther was purposeful in his use of music to play an important role in teaching the unlearned lay folk. And something as seemingly simple as a chant formula can do that because it hits the ear after a while. You get to, you get to hear, oh yeah, that's exactly the same pitches. La da 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 da. That, just that will signal that it's gospel, whether it's the gospel lesson that's being proclaimed or whether it's the words of institution. In his closing paragraphs of the 1526 Deutsche Messe, Luther noted, quote, we must continue to use Latin until we have enough German songs. This work is just beginning. Not everything has been prepared that is needed, end quote. But three years earlier in the Formula Missae, Luther had already noted the need for German songs. Again, I stress that these two documents are profitably considered in tandem, one in light of the other. After focusing on how the Latin mass should be observed in Wittenberg, Luther moved rather abruptly and perhaps unexpectedly to a call for German language hymns. Now remember, this is in 1523 in the Formula Missae when he's ostensibly going to talk to us about Latin. But he says near the end of that document, I also wish that we had as many songs as possible in the vernacular, which the people could sing during mass, immediately after the gradual and also after the Sanctus and Agnus Dei. The pastors may have these congregational hymns sung either after the Latin chants or use the Latin on one Sunday and the vernacular on the next, until the time comes that the whole Mass is sung in the vernacular. But poets are wanting among us, or not yet known, who could compose evangelical and spiritual songs worthy to be used in the Church of God. For few are found that are written in a proper devotional style. I mention this to encourage any German poets to compose evangelical hymns for us." End quote. Luther's power of and recognized the value of having the people sing in their own language, both to learn the content of the faith through poetry and music, and then to proclaim that faith to one another in music. But note that Luther insists that these songs, hymns, or chorales be worthy to be used in the Church of God and written in a proper devotional style. Luther's call for German language hymns leads to the second part of my paper. In December 1523, even as he outlined the Latin Mass as he wished it to be observed in Wittenberg, Luther was already thinking ahead to an entirely vernacular Mass, 
Furthermore, he was advocating the insertion of German hymns into the Latin Mass, Luther's power of and. But he did more than simply mention the need for German poets to compose evangelical hymns. He cajoled his co-workers very directly regarding this project. For example, at the end of 1523, about the same time that the Formula Missae was printed, Luther wrote this letter to a Wittenberg colleague, Georg Spalatin, asking him to work on the hymn project. And I quote from this letter of 1523. Luther says, our plan is to compose psalms for the people in the vernacular, so that the word of God may be among the people also in the form of music. Therefore, we are searching everywhere for poets, since you, Spalatin, are endowed with a wealth of knowledge and elegance in handling the German language, and since you have polished your German through much use, I ask you to work with us on this project. Try to adapt one of the psalms for use as a hymn, as you may see I have done in this example. And we suspect that Luther had sent him uh, his copy of Aus Tiefer Not, Schrei ich zu dir, um, he, Luther's own German paraphrase of Psalm 130. Back to Luther. But I would like you to avoid any new words or the language used at court. In order to be understood by the people, only the simplest and most common words should be used for singing. At the same time, however, they should be pure and apt. And further, the sense should be clear and as close as possible to the psalm. That's end quote from Luther. How do you like that, poets? He says, I want you to avoid any new words or the fancy language used at court. Um, I want you to use only the simplest and most common words, but those words need to be pure, they need to be apt, and the sense should always be as clear and close as possible to the original. That's a very tough order, but that's his charge to poets. While there is no evidence that Spalatin ever provided a hymn text for Luther's project, the years 1523 to 1524 nonetheless saw an amazing burst of poetic and musical activity, resulting in the earliest printed collections of Lutheran hymns. The year 1524 saw the publication of, first, a collection of eight hymns, four by Luther, printed in Nuremberg, the so-called Acht Liederbuch, eight songbook, Second, there were two Erfurt hymnals from rival printers, but both containing the same 26 hymns, and both entitled Enchiridion, meaning handbook. Those volumes contain music notation for some, though not all, of the hymn melodies. Another 1524 publication provided polyphonic settings for choir of this newly emerging repertory of vernacular hymns. Johann Walter's Geistliche Gesang Buchlein, his little book of spiritual songs, printed in Wittenberg. This collection is an absolutely remarkable achievement. That Johann Walter could compose 38 polyphonic settings for three, four, or five voices in this newly emerging genre of German chorales bespeaks amazing compositional ability and stylistic fluency, doubtless formed in part by Walter's use as a, years as a singer of Latin sacred polyphony, for example, he sang the music of Joscan at the Elector's Court in Torgau. Now, what were the functions of these 1524 hymnals? How might they have been used? Walter's collection of polyphonic settings was, of course, intended for choirs. Luther's preface to this published collection noted two purposes for these polyphonic chorale settings. The first, proclamatory. The second, pedagogical. As to the proclamatory function of these polyphonic settings, Luther wrote, Quote, therefore I too, in order to make a start and to give an incentive to those who can do better, have with the help of others compiled several hymns, so that the holy gospel, which now by the grace of God has risen anew, may be noised and spread abroad. End quote. Regarding the pedagogical function of Walter's hymn settings, Luther wrote, and these songs were arranged in four parts to give the young who should at any rate be trained in music and the other fine arts, something to wean them away from love ballads and carnal songs and to teach them something of value in their place." End quote. What about the function of these Nuremberg and Erfurt collections of 1524? We should not imagine that such volumes were purchased in quantity and placed in the church as churches as pew hymnals. Instead, they functioned as devotional and teaching books for individuals to use at home and within family settings. So it is plausible that individuals might on occasion have carried such books with them to church. 
Was Luther's emphasis on German language hymns a new and innovative phenomenon? In fact, religious song in the German language is not new with Luther. And there is much evidence for pre-Reformation vernacular religious song, which has been studied most recently by Robin Lever in his new book, The Whole Church Sings, Congregational Singing in Luther's Wittenberg, a brand new publication this year from Erdman's, and it's a really good book. Particularly important as a predecessor genre to Luther's hymns is the so-called Liza, a distinctive religious folk song stemming from the early medieval period. The Liza takes its name from the concluding refrain of each stanza, Kyrie eleison, but often shortened to a contraction form such as Kyrie lies, hence the word Liza. One of the most popular Lizen was the Easter text, Christ ist erstanden, which we still sing as the Easter hymn, Christ is Arisen. The 2006 Lutheran service book substitutes the refrain word Alleluia for the original Kyrie lies. By contrast, the 1941 Lutheran hymnal used that original refrain, Lord have mercy. The popularity of the Liza Christus der Standen is verified by its presence in over 100 manuscripts dating from the 12th through the 15th centuries, as well as in a further, one, a further 51 manuscripts and printed sources dating from just the first half of the 16th century. Luther thought highly of this Liza and spoke of it in a sermon on the first Sunday after Easter in 1523, thus at precisely the time he was beginning to plan his hymn project. Of Christus der Standen, Luther said, quote, this is what is being sung everywhere at this time as the hymn of the Lord's resurrection. Thus, even as he began to conceive his hymn project, Luther was building on previous genres of congregational song. The 1524 Acht Liederbuch begins with Luther's hymn, Nun freut euch, known to us in its English translation, Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice. And here, if you would, please see the last page of the handout. In the Acht Liederbuch, the hymn is dated 1523, attesting to Luther's intensive work on the hymn project begun in that year. And what you have is a, a photocopy of the first two pages from the Acht Liederbuch and that particular hymn. In 10 stanzas, Luther masterfully divides law and gospel, enabling us, as his first stanza in our English translation says, to proclaim the wonders God has done. Of course, of course, Luther doesn't stop there. The subsequent nine stanzas proclaim God's abundant love for sinful humanity, sending his beloved son, stanza five, to be our ransom, stanza seven, whose innocence shall bear our sin, stanza eight. In condensed poetic form, Luther provides a stunning precy of his theological writings, making it possible, as he wrote to Spalatin in late 1523, for the word of God to be among the people also in the form of music. This hymn exemplifies brilliantly the goals of Luther's hymn project. What can we say about the music, the melody of this early hymn by Luther? The Acht Liederbuch preserves the melody still associated with this text in our contemporary Lutheran hymnals. That melody, like the text, is the work of Luther. It was carefully crafted by Luther to enable and facilitate group singing. There are seven melodic phrases, each with eight pitches. In modern terms, an eighth note pickup followed by seven equal quarter note pitches. Moreover, phrases one and two are repeated as phrases three and four. That kind of repetition, A, A, B, in German poetry is called bar form, which has the effect of making the melody easier for the ear to grasp, a critical feature in the oral transmission and assimilation of a melody. And let's look at that melody for a moment. Um, let me sing it to you in German. Um, the English is, of course, Dear Christians, one and all rejoice with exultation springing, and with united heart and voice and holy rapture singing. Proclaim the wonders God has done, how his right arm the victory won. What price our ransom cost him. So here's what it sounds like, um, and you can kind of follow the melody along as I sing it. Nun freut euch, lieben Christen gemein, und lasst uns fröhlich springen, dass wir getrost und all in ein mit Lust und Liebe singen, was Gott an uns gewendet hat, 
und seine süße Wundertat, gar Tor hat es erworben. So you can hear that repetition of the first two phrases, one and two, as three and four. The terminology bar form, incidentally, is likely at the root of the myth that Luther drew on tunes from bars or taverns for some of his melodies. There is no evidence whatsoever that he did so. In fact, only once did Luther draw on a folk song, not on a drinking song, for one of his hymn melodies. The first tune associated with his Christmas hymn, From Heaven Above to Earth I Come, was borrowed from a secular dance tune. As this Christmas text went outside of the Luther household to be included in printed hymnals, Luther wrote a new tune, the one we sing today, to replace the secular dance tune. One final comment on Luther's hymn, Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice. Robin Lieber notes that when the 200th anniversary of the Lutheran Reformation was planned in 1717 for Saxony in Germany, they specified that the Vespers service for the evening of October 30th was to begin with, quote, the hymn of praise by Luther, nun freut euch lieben Christengemein. That the planners of the 200th anniversary should call this a hymn of praise accords well with Luther, who made the following comment in a 1538 preface to a collection of Latin polyphonic music. Luther wrote, after all, the gift of language combined with the gift of song was only given to man to let him know that he should praise God with both word and music, namely by proclaiming the word of God through music. Luther makes clear that the way we praise God is by proclaiming the word of God, by proclaiming the wonders God has done. In sum, then, Luther's work from 1523 to 1526 laid a foundation for Lutheran church music. This foundation was built on preserving the rich heritage of liturgy and music as it had developed from the second century, through the Middle Ages and into the early 16th century. The mass was retained, excising only those texts that confused sacrifice and sacrament, texts that were incongruent with, incongruent with the gospel, with Christ's gifts of his body and blood, in, with, and under bread and wine. When the Mass was retained, so also were extensive repertories of Latin chant, which had developed from the late 7th century, and Latin polyphony, Latin motets, as well as polyphonic Mass ordinaries set by 15th and early 16th century composers, like Schoskan. Luther's call for vernacular hymns led to a rich flowering of German language chorales with newly composed texts and tunes printed both as single sheets and as hymn collections. Moreover, from the earliest manifestations of this new repertory of German chorales, Luther encouraged composers like Johann Walter to compose polyphonic settings, thus providing a German language equivalent to Latin polyphony. Luther's power of and engendered both Latin and German liturgies, Latin and German chants, Latin and German polyphony. That power of and, that rich heritage of well-crafted music by composers thoroughly trained in their art was, and still is, subsequently perpetuated by composers from the 17th century to our day. Which takes me to part three of my paper. How does Luther's foundation for church music play out in subsequent centuries? If I were to restrict myself to choosing only one composer who perpetuated Luther's foundation for church music, I would name the following. In the 17th century, Michael Praetorius. In the 18th century, Johann Sebastian Bach. In the 19th century, Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdy. In the 20th and 21st centuries, lots of people to choose from, I'm gonna name Paul Mons and Karl Scholl. Of course, there are many other composers who could be named here, but these will suffice for two brief case studies illustrating the continuity of Luther's foundational principles for church music. The first case study focuses on the continuing use of Latin polyphony in the 17th and 18th centuries. The second case study is the continuation of the congregational chorale repertory and more specifically elaborations of chorales. Luther's power of and, embracing both Latin and German liturgical texts, continued into the 17th and 18th centuries. Michael Pretorius, one of the most prolific of all Lutheran composers, had a direct link to the Luther circle in Wittenberg, since his father was a colleague of Johann Walter. Praetorius provided over 1,000 chorale settings, ranging from simple harmonizations to elaborate compositions for multiple choirs. 
He also published separate collections in 1611 of his own Latin polyphonic compositions, mass movements, predominantly for the ordinary of the mass, Latin hymns for the church year and settings of the Magnificat, Latin hymns and the Magnificat being prominent parts of the Vespers liturgy. During Johann Sebastian Bach's Leipzig years, 1723 to 1750, a Latin motet was a standard part of the Sunday morning Gottesdienst or divine service. The motet positioned at the very beginning of the service, immediately before the Kyrie. For those motets, Bach drew primarily on older motet repertories from the 16th and early 17th centuries, as preserved in two extensive printed anthologies compiled by Erhard Bodenschatz, a Lutheran cantor, pastor, composer, and music editor. His first anthology of Latin motets was published in 1603, with a second and large edition dating from 1618. A second volume of motets appeared in 1621. These volumes enjoyed continuous use in schools and churches in the German-speaking lands, especially in cities and towns that had Latin schools, like the St. Thomas School in Leipzig, where Bach served as cantor. Just as Luther would not jettison the Latin language, the Latin mass with its chants or Latin polyphony, opting instead for liturgical and musical continuity with the rich traditions of the Western church, so also Praetorius in the 17th century continued to compose Latin polyphony for use in the mass and vespers, and Bach in the 18th century continued to draw on older Latin motet repertories, finding in them well-crafted compositions that continued to play a proclamatory role in the liturgical life of Lutheranism. As a second brief case study in the chronological continuity of Luther's foundation for church music, I turn to the Lutheran chorale repertory. That the repertory of chorales has continued from 1524 to our present day is on the one hand so obvious, given the content of our current Lutheran hymnals, as to render commentary superfluous. On the other hand, we should not simply take for granted the fact that so many of the chorales from Luther's time are still widely sung today. But in addition to the repertory of chorales initiated by Luther and his co-workers, and sub subsequently extended by thousands of texts and tunes written beyond Luther's time, there are separate but related musical repertories that may be conceptualized as what I call elaborations of chorales. By elaborations, I mean musical compositions that take a chorale melody as a point of departure, elaborating on that melody and ultimately creating musical entities one step removed from the congregational chorale, but which retain the same proclamatory function of the congregational chorale. Thus, just as the congregation that sings Luther's hymn of praise, Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice, proclaims the good news of the gospel, so also does the choir that sings a polyphonic elaboration of that chorale. And so does the organist who plays a purely instrumental elaboration on the chorale, a so-called chorale prelude for organ. We have no evidence that the organ played any kind of prominent role at either the castle church or the city church of St. Mary's in Luther's Wittenberg. Indeed, it would be the late 16th and particularly the 17th centuries that would see the rapid and extensive development of the organ as the central instrument for Lutheran churches in the German-speaking lands. As the instrument itself developed, becoming more flexible in the deployment of its individual sounds, so too did various organ repertories develop, one being the chorale prelude. The organ chorale prelude functioned in part as a musical composition or improvisation that could precede and introduce the congregational singing of a chorale, stating the melody about to be sung by the congregation and setting the pitch for that singing. That functional intent is best realized when the chorale melody is stated by the composer clearly and perceptibly. When that happens, information is conveyed by means of what I call an associative communication process. Hearing the chorale or hymn melody prompts the recall of an associated hymn text, which in turn prompts recognition of theological concepts conveyed by that hymn text. Think of this proposition as three T words, tune, text, theology. Perception of the tune signals a text, which signals associated theological meaning. Thus, if you were to hear this tune on Christmas Eve, 
you might be surprised. Bum bum beam bum ba dum ba dum ba da 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 dum ba da dum bum bum. That tune will signal to a culture that knows that tune and text. It will signal a particular meaning. Now, how, do, how does all of this relate to my overall theme of continuity, especially when the organ chorale prelude was not a specific part of the foundation laid by Luther? While Luther did not know organ elaborations of chorales, he recognized and appreciated vocal elaborations of chorales. The latter, of course, conveys the actual chorale text. While the organ chorale prelude sounds a melody that signals, but does not directly state, a text. And yet the organ, with its variety of sounds, is indeed capable of singing a chorale. And that is precisely the functional continuity that extends from the 17th century to our present day. From Pretorius to Bach to Mendelssohn to Mans and Schalk, all of whom have written organ music that clearly states chorale or hymn melodies. Consider, for example, settings by Bach and Mans of the Advent Chorale that we know as Savior of the Nations Come. And here I ask you to open your um, handout to the middle two pages. So down on the bottom of the right-hand page, you will see a little example from this Erfurt hymnal from 1524. It says, Hymnus, Veni Redemptor Gentium. And then you will see below the melody and the German text, Nun komm der Heiden Heiland. The melody of this chorale, known in German as Nun komm der Heiden Heiland, is found in the 1524 Erfurt and Chiridia and in Walter's choral hymnal. The tune derives from a medieval German melody associated with uh, the fourth century Latin text, Veni Redemptor Gentium. Luther adjusted this older melody to suit the German translation of the text. Bach's organ setting, BWV 661, one of four settings he provided on this chorale, is a contrapuntal marvel with the chorale melody clearly stated in the pedal. Mons's setting, published in 1962 in his first volume of 10 chorale improvisations, is patterned on 20th century French organ toccatas with the chorale melody again clearly stated in the pedal. And now, it's our great advantage that we're in this room. I didn't know that we would be in this room. Um, and so I asked Dr. Mueller yesterday if he would be willing to play these two excerpts, which is ever so much better than me pointing to them and saying, you'll see my arrows showing the melody in the pedal. So Dr. Mueller is going to play back to back the little excerpt from Bach and the little excerpt from Mons. The only frustration is you won't get to hear those entire pieces. Another time. Thank you very much, Dr. Mueller. Um, there's not very many people that I could do this with, you know, the night before to say, could you play these two excerpts? Oh, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, you have such a wonderful faculty member in Tom Mueller. Um, these two settings differ significantly in terms of overall musical style and in terms of harmony and counterpoint. But the common denominator is the clear and perceptible presence of the chorale melody. These chorale elaborations by Johann Sebastian Bach and Paul Mons are but two examples 
that grow out of the musical foundation laid by Martin Luther. In this particular case study, the chorale text and tune come to us directly from Luther as part of his hymn project from 1523-1524. But I'm more interested here in the broader musical context. First, it was Luther who founded the genre of chorales, German language hymns. Second, it was Luther who welcomed and promoted art music in the Latin and German language liturgies that he helped to define. While he himself never knew the genre of the organ chorale prelude, there is no conceptual difference between the Latin mass ordinaries of Josquin de Pre, the polyphonic German chorale setting of Johann Walter, or the organ chorale preludes of Johann Sebastian Bach in the 18th century and Paul Mons in the 20th century. All of these genres owe their proclamatory function in the liturgy to Luther's generous view of music as a means for the word of God to be among the people. Luther laid the foundation that permits the church's composers, past and present, to apply their craft to the task of providing music for the divine service. Together with Norman Nagel, in his introduction to the 1982 hymnal Lutheran Worship, we can affirm that we are indeed, and I quote from Nagel, heirs of an astonishingly rich tradition, end quote. A tradition that saw its conceptual foundation established by Martin Luther during the formative years of 1523 to 1526. Thank you very much for your attention. We have some time for questions. Uh, students first and only then faculty and staff. And I will, if you've got a question, I'll try and get the microphone over to you. So students, do any of you have questions that you would like to ask Dr. Zager? If you would. Uh, so you said earlier that uh, Luther attempted to remove any music that um, portrayed the divine service as something sacrificial, something that we do for God rather than sacramental, God bringing it to us, and that part of that was the offertory. But even in the modern offertory, we do sing, I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving mm -hmm. in two of our divine services. So do you think or do you think that Luther would consider that possibly uh, heretical? Or? No, that's, that's a great question. Um, the offertory today has a different function than it did in the Latin mass text of Luther's day, uh, connected so closely as it was with the canon of the mass. Um, and if I had lots and lots of time, I would like to have read to you in English translation the words um, of the canon of the mass and the offertory that would have preceded it. And because they were so closely linked, Luther decided that the various offertory texts, and they would have been different for every Sunday of the church or every feast of the church here, that they were simply not adequate. I think primarily because they were linked so closely to this sacrificial notion of the people offering a sacrifice to God. Not a sacrifice of praise, as the psalmist would say, but the mass as a sacrifice. So when we sing an offertory today, you know, when, when I was growing up with the 1941 hymnal, it was creating me a clean heart, O oh God. Um, that's not the kind of offertory function or text that Luther was speaking about. Seeing no other hands, we'll open it up to everybody. Questions? Dr. Zager, you mentioned a um, tradition of church music that dates back um, to the second century. Uh, considering all the different threads of church music today, um, based on your knowledge of history and the trajectory of church music, over the years, what would you consider some of the top principles in choosing church music for worship? Um, I need, Dr. Held, I need to clarify that when I mentioned the second century, it didn't have to do with music, but with the overall pattern of the, the uh, Christian worship service as Justin Martyr observed it around 150 AD, a kind of pattern that uh, can be broken down today to um, word and sacrament, um, gathering, um, 
word, sacrament, sending, those kinds of basic ordo concepts that we have today. But I wouldn't maintain um, that the music itself came from the second century. So far as we know, the Roman Schola Cantorum started crafting chant in the latter years of the seventh century. And so it's the musical inheritance that Luther had dated from, I would say, the late seventh century. Now, more directly to your question, you're asking about some overall uh, considerations of what music would be best used and best needed in the church. Is that right? And what are principles for someone selecting music for worship services? He said principles for people selecting music for worship services. One of the things I try to stress in the sacred music classes I teach at Eastman is to find our context in two things, the liturgical year and the lectionary. Um, and what I hope for composers of the church and for we as performing church musicians, we who conduct choirs and, and play instruments, that we will always find our bearings in those historical um, touchstones of Christian liturgy, the, the church year and the lectionary. And when I say the lectionary, I'm fully aware that there are various lectionaries, um, whether it's a kind of historic one-year type that can go all the way back to Luther's time, or frankly, the kind I find um, uh, at least as good, if not better, the three-year lectionary that came in with, with the Second Vatican Council. Um, but to find our bearings in lessons from Scripture that have been chosen well to match one another so that the Old Testament lesson and the Gospel lesson often link well, and that we can then choose hymnody especially, especially hymnody, um, that will illuminate those kinds of lessons and those kinds of connections. Um, and so it's hymns that I'm most concerned about. And when I had the privilege of serving on the hymnody committee for LSB, one of the things we looked for were um, hymns that would fulfill lectionary functions. Oftentimes in the past when I've been selecting hymns, I've been frustrated at not being able to find texts that will really speak to um, the lessons of the day, lessons that I know my pastor is going to preach on. Um, so, uh, so Jeff, those are the kind of things I hope that will happen as we continue to, to work as church musicians, whether composers, um, teachers, performers, the whole gamut of what you teach here and at any of the other Concordias, um, where we're really focused on um, church year and lectionary and making our music do what Luther said, which is to be among the people in the, the Word of God, to be among the people in the form of music. And I think it will work best when we work within those constraints, those self-imposed constraints, which are healthy, of liturgical year and lectionary. Uh, in that same vein, that's, I would say, talking about the content of yes. church music. What about style? Do you think we should stick with, you mentioned hymnals, or should and can stylistic changes in music be useful or potential? Stylistic changes in music have been a, a constant in terms of the history of church music. In other words, um, the hymnody that we sing today, and again, I'll go back to the um, my work on, on Lutheran Service Book, it does indeed carry in um, musical styles that developed during Luther's time. It brings in as well the uh, Genevan Psalter repertory um, of Luther's counterpart, uh, compatriot in Switzerland, John Calvin, even though they differed vastly in certain aspects of theology, Calvin's music nonetheless finds a place in Lutheran hymnals and most other hymnals. It's a different style, though. As we move into the 17th, 18th century, different harmonic vocabularies. Certainly as we move into the 20th century, um, we see hymns that don't always behave harmonically the way hymns from, say, the 16th or 18th century did. Um, if we break them down harmonically, we can see um, dissonances that are not prepared. We can see extensions of... Uh, uh, harmony that is normally in thirds, uh, extended uh, you know, to ninths, elevenths, and that sort of thing. All the harmonic devices that we have to enrich our, our, har our harmonies uh, 
find their place in him accompaniments as well. Um, so I think that stylistic change in that way is, is simply inevitable as composers begin to explore different ways of doing things. Um, I remember when I first encountered a melody by Jan Bender. It was for a Martin Franzman hymn, O God, O Lord of Heaven and Earth. Bum, beam, bum, beam, bum, 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 bum. When you look at um, not only the melody, but the harmonization, it takes us into different areas than we had been in previously. Or Carl Schalk's hymn, Now. Uh, when you look at just the, the harmonic underpinnings of that wonderful melody, or his hymn, uh, Thine the Amen, Thine the Praise, there are different harmonies there. And so uh, we, we do find ourselves in different places. And I wonder sometimes if in the next decade or so, we will find some of our hymns more and more um, reflecting a kind of minimalism that we see so often in music today. Um, the kind of John Adams uh, harmony, uh, minimalism that we see, Glass and Adams and others, will we see that kind of more static sound be a part of um, our hymnody? At Eastman, we, com we commissioned a composer last year named Nico Muli to write a hymn melody and setting for a hymn text that we commissioned from Thomas Troger at Yale Divinity School. We have a, we're really lucky at Eastman. We have a, a fund for commissioning and for doing competitions for new hymn texts and new tunes. And when we sang Nico Muli's hymn, um, I kind of had to smile because thinking back to my LSB days, that hymn wouldn't have made the cut. You know, it was kind of invested in minimalist musical language. And it, it wouldn't have made it into LSB. But what about the, the hymn, hymnal that comes after LSB? What about 20, 30 years from now? Maybe it will. It's a much more adventuresome harmonic language. And maybe we'll go there. I can't say. Dr. Zager, you discussed these three musical publications from 1524. Yes. Two of which you know, clearly seem to be designed for the layperson in that they present a German text, they present a simple single chorale melody. They use common poetic forms of the time. But with the Walter Gesang book, where we see now vernacular language and these melodies, but now being set in a polyphonic style, which implies art music and the, the skills of a trained or professional level musician to bring it off in performance. Could you comment on how these two different trends may have been used in worship at this time in practical terms? and? I mean, what that means for our understanding of the use of the vernacular or the use of these new melodies when it's so being quickly being applied to the demands of art music at this time? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, some in the past, um, I and others have kind of glibly thought, without thinking it through carefully, that Walter's settings must have been used to introduce the, uh, the settings for congregants. Uh, you know, they didn't know these, these melodies all that well, so Presumably, Walter's polyphonic settings would have been used then to acquaint them with the melody, and then they'd sing the hymn themselves. And that's clearly not the case, because the melody is usually placed in the tenor voice, um, tenera, the Latin ver verb meaning to hold. The tenor voice held that pre-existent um, uh, melody, and usually in quite long notes, and not easily perceptible to the ear in terms of how it might have then been sung by a congregation. Um, so I think that what we have with Walter's hymns is not something that's connected with congregational singing, not something that would introduce singing um, for the congregants in Luther's Wittenberg. We have some excerpts from uh, Luther's sermons where he kind of rails against his congregants and said, he says, look, these hymns have been provided to you so that you can learn and you can sing, but you sit there like blocks of wood and you don't sing them. Well, I mean, it was a very new proposition and it wasn't easy for them all of a sudden to begin singing these hymns, even though they had been singing Liza, like Christus der Standen, earlier, but they had a fairly limited repertory. So the best way I can answer Dr. Mueller's question is to say that these are two separate but related propositions. 
that we have, on the one hand, monophonic singing for the congregation that would have probably been introduced by a solo voice and, and led by a kind of forzinger or a precentor. And then on the other hand, we have these repertories of hymns that if you listen to Luther's preface, um, would have been useful uh, for uh, proclamatory purposes, putting the, the word of God out there among the people, but also for teaching the young how to sing. And in many respects, I think it might have enjoyed a pedagogical function um, in the same way that um, composers these days, if you are a church musician who gets uh, on two, two times a year a packet of anthems from Concordia Publishing House, you look through it, and some of our composers are writing music for children's choirs, and they're incorporating hymn tunes. And I think that's one of the great things that comes from um, Lutheran uh, composers in the United States is that they're, they're specifically writing for children's choir and not making it too complex, but using those great melodies. Um, so that's kind of a long rambling answer, uh, but I think the functions of those publications are complementary rather than intertwined. Dr. Zager will have a few minutes afterwards to, for you to come up and speak with him. He does, we do have to get him to the airport moderately soon. So if you would share him as you come forward, that would be wonderful. Uh, for now, please thank Dr. Zager again. And I, and I get the last word to thank all of you. Thank you for your hospitality and thank you for inviting me.